Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Vector, coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting edition of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Vaughn Smith, and this is our Cisco Cloud Fundamentals series. And this episode, we are going to talk about VLANs and VXLANs that continues on in our cloud networking topic area. And back to help us is the one and only Mr. Ronnie Wong. How are you? I am doing well, Vaughn. Thank you again for joining us as we continue through taking a look at some of these different concepts and more specifically concepts that we have to know about as we're preparing, of course, for our cloud fundamentals exam. And so we are up to that topic where we talk about VLANs and VXLANs. Now, Vaughn, uh, I'm pretty sure that at least during the time that you and I have known each other, you, you've heard what a VLAN is, but the term VXLAN may actually be the one that you're not as familiar with, right? You know, any time with an X in a title, I'm thinking it's just bigger and better. It's extra. Extra? Virtual. <laughs> sure, yeah. Well, we can go with that, but we don't know if that would actually be right. So <laughs> Probably so, not. Yeah. But, but it sounds no, cool. Yeah, at, at this point, uh, most of us have probably heard about VLANs. If you come to this point where you're actually now taking a look at VLANs, you should be quite familiar with at least that concept. Now, remember that the actual uh, exam itself and the CCNA cloud doesn't require you to go all the way through your CCNA routing and switching before you start on this track, but you do need to have at least some fundamental knowledge of networking as we get into, well, some of the things that we're about to talk about now and, of course, the virtual networking. You have to at least have the basic concepts down. And so VLANs is probably one of the more familiar concepts that we actually can kind of understand as well, okay? Okay. So remember that for us in terms of VLANs, okay? It stands for Virtual Local Area Network and what it allows us to be able to do, okay? So when we have Layer 2 technologies such as a Layer 2 switch, okay, it allows us to be able to take a single switch. And let's say that there's 48 ports on that switch, Vaughn. I can take some of those ports. They don't have to actually be all grouped together, but I can take some of those ports, let's say 10 of those ports, and I can group them together in a VLAN. Now, what that allows me to do, Vaughn, is it now allows me to take those 10 ports and treat it as if it's its own separate switch, okay? So that means all of those devices plugged in that little 10-port VLAN, at that point, they all see each other as if they're directly connected to the same switch. But what about the other ports on that switch? Well, the other ports on that switch, they're not going to actually look like that they're actually, they're a part of that VLAN, and that means devices that are connected into VLAN 10, if that's what I created, well, those other ports aren't going to do that. But it also allows me then to create VLAN 20, 30, 40. I can create many of them, and each one can be separate and individual and allows me to create multiple essential smaller uh, switches on a single physical switch. So I'm logically segmenting or chopping up that switch so that we can use them in ways that are actually more effective to us instead of buying a single switch that has 48 ports on it, and I'm only using 10 of them, and effectively, I can't reuse that switch to help me to, to do something else if I need to, such as create a different network if I need, okay? Now, the other thing that a VLAN also, of course, allows us to do is let's say that I have a stack of multiple switches that have 48 ports in them, but instead of actually just stacking them all together in one physical location, I put them around the building, okay? Now, I put them around the building, but I still need them to be grouped together, okay? So I can actually say... What I'm going to do is I'm going to create VLAN 10, but spread it out across those multiple switches. And now all of those different switches have VLAN 10 on them. And all of the devices that I end up plugging into VLAN 10, they all look like that they're actually part of one particular switch. All those devices in VLAN 10 can communicate with each other perfectly fine, but they won't be able to communicate with anybody else without, of course, some intervening technology to help us do that. So it can either help us to take one switch and chop it up and treat it as multiple switches, smaller switches, but multiple switches, or I can actually take well, multiple switches and spread a VLAN across them, essentially treating those ports on different switches as one big switch if I want to, or one larger switch, and then create other VLANs that does the same thing. So that's the basics behind the idea of VLANs. Now, Vaughn, when we start doing this with physical switches, Sometimes we don't realize that there are limitations to them, and that's uh, at least for those of us that are going for certification training, okay? And the reason why we don't realize that limitation is that when we're doing the training, we might create, let's say, a maximum of 10 VLANs sometimes, okay? 
And when we do that, we might think, man, look at all the VLANs I've created. That's a ton of them. But there is a limitation to the number of VLANs that you can create. And if you follow a particular standard, which is where some of this comes from, okay, is that if you actually do this, there's 802.1Q, and that says that you can actually create between VLANs 1 and 4,094. So in theory, about 4,094 possible VLANs are possibly out there. But that doesn't mean that every single switch will support 4,094 VLANs. It depends on the model of the switch. It depends on some of the other configurations that are actually there. It depends on how these things are actually worked out. You may find out that some switches only support 1,000 VLANs. Okay? You may find out that some smaller switches may not support any more than a handful of VLANs as well. So there are some limitations behind VLANs, such as the capabilities that's actually built into the switch itself. Now, when we start talking about it from the standpoint of cloud fundamentals, you might be wondering, even though we can actually do this, okay, and why am I starting to talk about the idea of limitations here? It is because when we start to move into the realm of cloud computing and cloud networking and cloud everything that we're talking about, well, now in the cloud, what's some of the basic technologies that we have to be able to translate and make it work? Well, when it comes down to layer two technology, okay, we still use switches in the cloud as well. And some of those technologies that we use to help us to break things apart so that we're using the switching space effectively is the same thing as VLANs. But now, Vaughn, here's essentially what ends up happening. So if I were to take and say that we build a cloud service together, Vaughn, and what we start to do is we buy a whole bunch of these switches and we start taking customers on, and then we realize something, Vaughn, let's say that there's 1,024 VLANs that we can create on there, okay? And let's say that our cloud service begins to actually grow. Well, how do I separate out customers at layer two in my cloud network, okay? The way that I do that is I'll go, okay, we'll just create a different VLAN for every single customer. It makes sense, right? So the same way that we created VLANs for things like our networking where we separated them out by department or by buildings or whatever it might be, I can do the same thing for customers. So Vaughn may have some different clients for web clients that you might have. So you might actually separate that out and do that. We might actually have different networks that are actually out there that we go, all right, different tenants, and we now provide VLANs. So Vaughn, I have one through 1,024. So Vaughn, we now are on our 1,025th customer. And Vaughn, there's no more VLANs to be created. So does that mean that my particular cloud network then, the only the maximum number of customers that I can have is going to be 1,024, okay? That's kind of a harsh reality if that's true, right? Because I'm not in this business just to say, I want to limit myself to 1,024 customers, but that's not even the half the reality of it too. Yeah, and a lot of times you might start off like, oh, I'll never fill these up or I'll never get that big. We had it in our office. Right. You know, we're like, oh, we have all the space in the world. We, we, we won't have any problem. <laughs> That filled up quick, and we had to go to the other side of the building yep. and build out an entire other office because we just didn't, we weren't expecting it. But I mean, it's one of those things where you're, you're going to need to expand mm -hmm. if you get to a certain capacity level that you need to just go out. So knowing right. where the limitations are is always good to start off with. Right. And that limitation actually is even more realistically smaller than that. And the reason why, Vaughn, is because sometimes if we limit every single customer to just a single VLAN, that would be ideal in that situation. That would give us the most maximum number of customers that we could have. But Vaughn, sometimes certain customers say, well, what I need is two or three different VLANs. Well, now you start dividing that up, and let's say that half of your customers then need two or three VLANs. Well, then the number of your actual maximum customers actually goes down because now you're actually taking up multiple customers as well. So there's actually all those things to have to worry about too. So when it comes down to what we're talking about then, especially in the cloud, we have to realize the limitations that physical switches have for us and also the limitations in the way that VLANs are actually work with. So let me go ahead and describe to you and show you essentially the three different limitations that we put in terms of VLANs, okay? So on the very top of my diagram that I've created here, okay, I essentially show you the breakdown of the 802.1Q header and you can see that it includes everything at layer two that you end up seeing. So 802.1Q, the key uh, uh, element of this, right, is right here where it says 802.1Q header. 
And notice it actually allows me to create a VLAN ID between 1 and 4094 at this point. So it's just four bytes that they've inserted into the middle of that frame to help us out to do what we need to do. Now, when it does that, and it actually creates a different VLAN number inside of here, the frame check sequence gets recalculated to actually account for that VLAN as well. So that's what makes it unique and individual, and it makes it very difficult for anybody to, to essentially uh, be able to recreate this very easily, okay? Because you're actually trying to say, hey, I'm going to spoof this, and you have to kind of rip this out of here, replace it with the VLAN that you want it to be in, and then the frame check sequence also has to match, which means you have to rerun and add that back in. So you can't just replace this VLAN without it also needing to calculate a new frame check sequence as well. So a little bit harder than what we think, okay? But overall, though, here's the basic Unix that we're, the unit that we're working with, which essentially is a frame. So when it comes down to VLANs, we have to also realize that the limitations that we have really come down to, well, three different elements in the physical networking environment, okay? So Vaughn, I've drawn, essentially, I didn't connect them all together, but let's say that we have 10 switches, okay? And so Vaughn, if I have VLAN 10 on the top switch that I've drawn over here, and then on one of them down here in the bottom switch as well, okay, I put VLAN 10 on those two switches between the top and bottom, there's two layers, of switches in between, well, Vaughn, does that mean that those two switches will be able to directly communicate with each other? Not really, okay? And the reason why is if I'm actually going to have them connected in this way, in this fashion, you know, to do all this, right? I might jump down to one layer and then to the next layer, but if VLAN tens are only on the ends here, between the top and the bottom left-hand corner one, well, they're not going to communicate because there's not VLAN 10 on any of the two layers in between. So Vaughn, that means I have to make sure that every switch along the path that gets me from one switch to another also would have to include VLAN 10 into it. It's almost like little stepping stones. You right. have to have stones that go all the way down to that level yep. because otherwise you can't step on them. <laughs> right, yeah, no, that's exactly right. The very fact is if I don't have the path to do that, so that's what begins to happen there, okay? So that doesn't sound like it's actually very much of a particular problem, except for the very fact that when we start to configure them, well, if we don't have another technology that we tend to use that we call VTP, virtual trunking pro or VLAN trunking protocol, then we have to go in and we have to configure on every single one of these switches. Okay, That's a lot of manual configuration to do so. Now, as much as that's actually kind of a limitation, okay, the second one that we have to deal with is what we call VLAN ID starvation here, okay? And this is essentially us running out of VLAN IDs, okay? If we end up having one particular tenant, like I said, that requests more than one, okay? Well, if I do that, that means the number of VLANs that I can assign out there reduces, well, you know, at least by one every time a customer signs up and says, I need more than one. Well, in that sense, we will run out of VLAN IDs after a while as well. And that could be kind of a, a, an issue when, when it comes down to it too, okay? So those are, again, limitations that in the cloud we don't want to actually have to worry about or do. And the reason why, especially with the provision is, is Vaughn, if we're doing this in the cloud network, and I have my cloud network actually scattered across, well, let's say, three or four different data centers all over the world, but provisioning these things, it means it takes a lot of time having to go in and manage those things just with regular VLANs, okay? Running out of VLAN IDs is also another particular issue that we have to worry about. But then the thing that I might not think about at all, okay, unless I've actually been in a production network and had this happen, where there are limitations to the MAC address table on the switches, okay? So Vaughn, this goes back to the fundamental networking of how a switch works, okay? Remember that for a switch itself, it really performs three primary functions. Now, don't get me wrong. You can manipulate and change how they work in that way, but it performs three functions, okay? So if I actually go with the basic nature of this, okay, it's all based off of how information is put into that MAC address table. Remember that it only inserts into the MAC address table the source, okay? A MAC address is what it does. So when a device begins to communicate into a switch, it actually takes the source of that header, okay, and it actually adds that MAC address into the table itself, and it attaches it to that port number is what it does, okay? So that's the beginning here. And now, 
when it actually needs to communicate with another one, it takes a look at the or to another machine. It takes a look in that MAC address table, and it says, all right, I'm looking for this MAC address, and what port do I send it out of? So Vaughn, if all those elements are actually in there, okay, well, then that means I can communicate port to port on that switch to be able to send or forward traffic from one port to another port, from source port to destination port, and it works perfectly fine, okay? The second thing, though, that can end up happening is what we call filtering, okay? Filtering is fairly simple. What if the source and destination MAC addresses are located off the same port? Well, if they're located off the same port, in other words, as I send data into that switch on that one port, it takes a look also at the MAC address table, and it also takes a look at the destination as well, and says, hey, that particular destination MAC address is located off the same port as the one it came in on. Well, the default functioning of what a switch does is it will send out or forward data out of every other port if it needs to, except for the one it came in on. So it says, hey, this is on the same port it came from, so I'm not going to actually put it onto the switch itself. I'm going to block it from going out, and that way it stays on that one port. Okay? And then ultimately, there's what we call flooding. And flooding is important because flooding essentially happens in two conditions here. One, an actual real broadcast. We intend to send it out to every port on the switch except for the one it came on up. So we can actually do that where we send it in. We send it to the broadcast MAC address, which is all Fs, and that will allow it to go through and do what we need to, communicate with every other device, hoping to get a response back. Or the second part of it is if I send something going to a MAC address that isn't in the MAC address table, okay? Two, poss- two three, four, maybe a handful of possibilities here. Let's talk about one of the possibilities. One possibility, though, Vaughn, and just the basic nature of this is simple. Okay? An unknown MAC address might be the device, the switch has yet to learn about that device. So when we first send it in and the switch doesn't know about that device, well, what will that sending device do? Okay? The switch will take a look and go, it's not in there. Let me go ahead and flood it out of every port. And you're smarter than I am, so it should actually send back a response when it comes in. So it's very possible that that's exactly what happens. Two, though, okay, and this is kind of the big two, right? Two, Vaughn, what if it actually looks in the MAC address table and says there are no other possible entries in the MAC address table because every single entry that can fill this MAC address table is filled, and I'm not learning any more anywhere else? Well, if that happens, then the switch also floods it out as well. So whether it's a true broadcast or whether it's actually an unknown MAC address, an unknown destination MAC address, well, then it begins to flood it out. And that's the problems that we have inside of the cloud. So Vaughn, if we now had those, let's say the 750 customers that we have, and now my MAC address table fills up, and even though I put them in separate uh, VLANs, okay, and it shouldn't actually matter where they are, well, in theory, right, what should also happen is that the broadcast should be limited to those particular, uh, you know, inside of that one VLAN. But it can also, of course, if we have layer three devices going on, you can also, again, flood it out, you know, to all those ports in that VLAN. So every time somebody's actually sending something in that way, it will flood every single port inside of those VLANs. By default, if you actually don't use VLANs at all, it will flood it out of every port on that switch as well, okay? So those are the three default natures. So in that sense, when we have something like that, then the limitation of the MAC address table is something that we have to worry about. And in production networks, you do worry about it, and you have to think about how this is going to work. So, Vaughn, let's take, for instance here, okay, that what we have is that we have, uh, let's say, uh, 10 different... Let uh, make sure I'm telling you right. Yep. Uh, let me do it this way, okay? I was trying to make sure I'm not, sw- I'm not uh, changing gears too fast, what I was, okay? In my mind, I was. So, what can happen? How in the world can we actually end up flooding a MAC address table very quickly? Vaughn, the way that this ends up happening is that if I have a single ESXi host, the one that has all the virtual machines on it, okay, if I have, let's say, 40 or 50 different VMs on that particular uh, ESXi host, okay, well, that means that when each one of those VMs actually needs to communicate out, it has to have an entry in that MAC address table. So Vaughn, essentially a single physical server plugging in that Mac, into that switch, it can actually end up having 40 or 50 different addresses on that one port, okay, if that's what happens. 
So now all of a sudden, let's say that there's a thousand, okay? Well, now on a single switch, we start plugging in and we plug in 20 servers that have an equal amount. Well, what if all of a sudden we realize something? There's not enough MAC address uh, entry you know, uh, for that, that table, and now we run out, and that means it will begin to flood out of what it needs to, okay? And that's a big problem that we have to deal with. If you want to talk about the combined nature of every single uh, MAC address table then inside of your cloud network. So let's go back to my diagram here for a moment, okay? So if on my diagram, if I have all these switches here, these 10 switches, okay, and I have, let's say, 40 virtual machine hosts, in other words, 40 ESI, EXSI servers on them, and each server, let's say, has 100 VMs on them, and Vaughn, if all of these, if we add up all of the actual uh, available space okay, in those MAC address tables, if we don't have more than 40,000 of them, if you add them, each one of them up, and there's not more than 4,000 addresses for them, it means I can run out of MAC address, table, MAC address entries inside of that database uh, as well. And that's when we start having issues too. So those issues that we have, even though it seems like a very small amount of issues, it can really turn out to be something that can be very limiting as well as damaging. So that means that somebody had to come up with something new to help us out, to help us to understand how we could actually overcome that. Okay? So Vaughn, that is what we need to talk about, is we need to talk about how do we overcome these limitations. The way that we do so, of course, is with the idea of VX lands. Okay. X meaning more, extended, bigger and better. Yeah, it really right? does. <laughs> yeah, it really does. And Vaughn, I'm looking over at the clock itself and I realized something that I could try and jam in everything I want to say about VX lands in five minutes, but it's probably not going to actually help you if I do. So let's go ahead and just end just a few minutes early here, Vaughn, and then we'll pick up with understanding more about the idea of VX lands and making sure that we get a good solid understanding of that as we walk through the process and show you why it actually effectively helps us to deal with all the problems and issues that we have with regular VLANs. All right. Well, you're leaving us with a little cliffhanger there, Ronnie. <laughs> Just like now we got to stay tuned for the next one. Just like all of our good television shows. So thank you for that. And stick around. Come back for more. But for now, we're going to go ahead and sign off for IT Pro TV. I've been your host, Vaughn Smith. And I'm Ronnie Wong. We'll see you soon. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.